Hello, people. Can you hear me? Lovely. OK, well, thank, thank you very much that. indeed for uh, coming along today. Uh, we've got 45 minutes for this session, which is with Bernard Jenkin, um, MP, the chair of the Public Administration Select Committee. Um, and first, we'll have a short speech on transparency, isn't it, in, in government? And uh, we'll have time for questions afterwards. So, thank you. Take it away. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me along and giving me this opportunity. In fact, the title I was given was Accountability and Transparency. But I'm going to start with transparency. And I should say, by way of introduction, the Public Administration Select Committee it sounds like um, something out of Yes Minister. Um, but we examine the quality and standards of administration within the civil service and we scrutinise the reports of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman, among other things. Transparency and accountability are not synonymous. Simply releasing new data will increase transparency, but how will this improve or affect accountability? We will not create accountability by dumping masses of data on the internet and saying, that's it, our job is over, we've put it all into the public domain. Data dumping does not on its own constitute transparency and good government. Government has an obligation, therefore, to provide intelligible data as well as raw data, and the Public Administration Select Committee, which also oversees the UK Statistics Authority and the Office of National Statistics, uh, we recommended in a recent report that uh, the authority should take a proactive role in ensuring that data is released uh, as intelligible, that it should be objectively interpreted when it is released and in a readily accessible format. Transparency does not merely encompass data, but also what people expect from government departments in their dealings with them in terms of openness and frankness. This includes what select committees of MPs now expect of civil servants. And all this is having and will have a dramatic effect on how government and public services operate. Just look at the NHS. It is not long ago that the very idea of publishing mortality data for hospitals was regarded as ghoulish and over the top. But it was mortality data that gave the first public and incon incontrovertible indications that something was very wrong at the Mid-Staffordshire Mid Hospital. Now we are even publishing mortality data for consultants. In fact, there is very little evidence that mortality data on its own is a good indicator of patient safety in a hospital, or how good a surgeon may be. But we will need to interpret this data intelligently and look at other data, but the principle is the same. The implementation of what is known in the jargon as open data is nothing short of a revolution for public services. The most profound change to the nature and accountability of public services we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Not just institutions, but individuals throughout our public services are going to be held much more accountable and publicly accountable for what they do and how well they perform. But what sort of accountability do we then want? The traditional notion of accountability in government is based on the Haldane Report of 1918, which recommended that civil servants as advisers to ministers were to have an indivisible relationship with them. And this notion has underpinned the conventions stated in the Cabinet Manual that civil servants are accountable to ministers who in return are accountable to Parliament. This was given new expression in the Armstrong Memorandum, which was produced by Lord Armstrong as head of the civil service in 1985, following the Clive Ponting case and following the arrival of departmental select committees. It addresses what a civil servant should do if he or she was being asked to do something which he or she believed to be unlawful, unethical, or against his or her conscience. The civil servant should report it to a senior official or the permanent head of the department. If the matter could not be resolved, the civil servant would be required to carry out the instructions or resign from the service. The memorandum reinforces the Haldane and asserts that the civil service has, and I quote, no separate constitutional personality from ministers. It goes on. There is and must be a general duty upon every civil servant serving or retired, not without authority, to make disclosures which breach that obligation. This duty applies to any document or information or knowledge of the course of business which has come to the civil servant in confidence in the course of their duty. And when before a select committee, he says, 
The civil servant's first duty is to his or her minister. Thus, when a civil servant gives evidence to a select committee, he or she does so as the representative of the minister and subject to the minister's instructions. Ultimate responsibility lies with ministers, not with civil servants, to decide what information should be available. So you have nothing to fear when you appear before a select committee. But I think that makes the point. Today, in the world of select committees which are now elected in the era of freedom of information and now of open data, the Armstrong Memorandum does not just look a little out of date. Its attitudes are archaic and its strictures on civil servants are absurd. The government says they are revising Armstrong, but for the time being it remains in force. The government is also looking at what they call the Osmotherly Rules. Now, Sir Edward Osmotherly was a clerk in the House of Commons, a hereditary baronet, as it happens, who was seconded to the Cabinet Office, and he wrote these rules while on secondment uh, in 1980. They were last updated in 2005, and they help government determine who should appear before a select committee and what they are allowed to say. In our report called Change in Government, which was um, a report we produced fairly early in this Parliament, PASC recommended that, and I quote, it is time, timely to consider the development of a new Haldane model to codify the changing accountabilities and organisation of government. And if you want evidence that the landscape of civil service accountability is changing, note what the Liaison Committee affirmed in November 2012. The Liaison Committee is the committee of all the select committee chairs who sit together as the Liaison Committee in Parliament and we uh, periodically cross-examine the Prime Minister. In our report on um, select committee powers and effectiveness, we concluded, uh, we do not accept that the Osmotherly rules should have any bearing on whom a select committee should choose to summon as a witness. Moreover, we've been looking at Haldane, which did in fact foreshadow the formation of departmental select committees when it stated, and note the implication of the construction of this sentence, and I quote, any such committees would require to be furnished with full information as to the course of administration pursued by the departments with which they were concerned. This is 1918. And for this purpose, it would be requisite that ministers, as well as officers of departments, should appear before them to explain and defend the acts for which they were responsible. So, Haldane saw it as obvious that civil servants would appear before select committees. What he saw as more revolutionary was the idea that ministers would be witnesses as well. So what of civil service reform and accountability? Where does this leave transparency and accountability in that context? Francis Maud's forward to the civil service reform plan emphasised the need, and I quote, to strengthen civil service accountability, unquote, and set out the government's intention to consider other models of accountability. The Civil Service Reform Plan itself proposed to sharpen and make more transparent the responsibility of accounting officers, including ensuring effective implementation of major government projects and programmes, requiring explicit accounting officer, accounting officer sign off for implementation plans, major gateway reviews, and cabinet committee papers, and establishing the expectation that former accounting officers return to give evidence to select committees on a time limited basis where there is a clear rationale to do so. Progress. But against the background of the twin revolutions of open data and elected select committees, does this not seem rather modest? Should we not be asking some much more fundamental questions about what we mean about the word, by the word, accountability? On the one hand, what is happening is transforming public and media expectations of how public officials should be held accountable, and indeed, it's becoming fashionable uh, to name and shame public officials who fail or are perceived to have failed. We saw this with the East Coast mainline fiasco and more recently with this, the failure of CQC over the Morecambe Bay Hospital baby deaths. The issue of accountability, however, must go higher up. What about the leadership above? But the system hangs on to Sir David Nicholson, the chief executive of the NHS, and the, and the permanent secretaries in their departments. The Civil Service Reform Plan proposes to increase the exposure of certain leading officials to external scrutiny, 
but at the same time, ministers seem determined to retain the traditional notion of ministerial accountability. And that's where the IPPR report comes in, the report commissioned by the government from the Institute of Public Policy Research, entitled Accountability and Responsiveness in the Senior Civil Service. It talks more about how to strengthen the accountability of civil service to ministers. We know, this is, we know why this is. It's because ministers are finding it hard to get their policies and decisions implemented. But is there a coherence between these two different notions of accountability? And will this, is there sufficient coherence to resolve the problems ministers are experiencing? The best interpretation is that ministers want to take more responsibility, but they know they cannot be responsible for the, in the traditional sense for every action of every official under their direction. The worst prospect is that we will see more ministers and indeed more senior civil servants under pressure from media and politicians dumping on their officials whenever something goes wrong rather than accepting their share of the responsibility. One can equally ask who gave the responsibility for franchising the West Coast Main Line to people whom it turned out did not have the skills or resources to carry out their task effectively? Who allowed the key figure with real experience in rail franchising to leave the department? Who was the responsible for the oversight of that team? Who banned the use of outside financial consultants, which they had always used in the past? And at CQC, you know, the questions go on. Who set it up? Who made the senior appointments? And so on. But in all cases like this, it is most unlikely that those who finish up getting blamed were deliriously happy public services, servants who were reveling in their job before they were found out. I expect they were under intense pressure and they knew about the impossibility of delivering what was being demanded. Most people in a failing organisation know that that organisation is failing. They just don't know what to do about it or how to tell their superiors about the failure. Recently, John Brown, Lord Brown of Maddingley, uh, formerly of BP, and now lead non-executive director in Whitehall, told the Institute of Government. And it's interesting, he said, in my experience, stories of failure are far more important. They keep you realistic about the challenges you face and stop you from losing touch with reality on the ground. Most importantly, they are the only powerful mechanism for learning. We are yet to learn that lesson in government, he said. An obsession with successes is not the fault of individuals. It is the result of an organization's induced behavior. To tell stories of failure, you need to record them. But why would a civil servant want to do that? The only consequence would be discovery through a freedom of information request, followed by a hue and cry to search for those to blame. So, in this new world of transparency and accountability, where failures are going to be far more regularly exposed, the present system will collapse. And we are seeing this increasingly. Just think of the borders agency or the tax credit system unless we change the whole culture of government. What we do want, sorry, I'll start that again. What do we want accountability to feel like? Not that you are about to be taken out and hanged in public. This will encourage people to hide bad information, to work in secret silos, because people use information as power in sick organizations, to go to meetings and pretend to agree to things, and then to leave the room and say something different. In the end, nobody takes responsibility, nobody feels that they are responsible, because nobody has been given the means to take genuine responsibility. I'd be interested to know if anybody finds this a familiar description. Instead, what we want, if you are made accountable, it should be a positive and empowering feeling. But for it to be so, you need to feel that you're going to be supported from above, that you can share your hopes and fears with your seniors, even with your ministers, so that you can take and embrace responsibility for delivering an outcome which everybody wants. Look at the London Olympic Games Committee and ask yourself, why was it such a success? And then ask, why did nobody at the Borders Agency tell the Home Secretary that the targets for clearing the backlog of asylum and visa applications were impossible to achieve? 
Why did nobody at CQC feel able to discuss what was going wrong until it was much too late? And I have to ask this question. What has gone wrong with the leadership of the civil service today and with the political leadership that does not hear what is really going on so we keep having these systemic failures? Why does nobody feel responsible or feel that they must take responsibility? A question as much for ministers and the political class as it is for the leadership of the civil service. This might help to explain why ministers feel they are being blocked. Departments and agencies believe they are being asked to deliver the impossible, but there is not an atmosphere in which problems and challenges can be properly explained and understood by those who determine policy. Indeed, there seems to be an ever wider separation between policy and implementation. And I cannot believe that getting this right is just about performance management, which can be so corrosive of genuine motivation, which is what brings people into work for the public service in the first place. This is about a system of decision-making which is in denial about what the system is capable of and in which those who do know what is wrong feel unable to tell those in authority the truth. The Civil Service Reform Plan does not address these fundamental questions. It has followed a series of rows and blunders and public disagreements with officials involving ministers of all parties. It is wrong to suggest that the Public Administration Select Committee has decided against the Civil Service Reform Plan. In my view, there are many new and good ideas in the Reform Plan. And indeed, there is much been achieved in recent years, which is very good. PASC may well express views on its various initiatives. The Efficiency and Reform Group is saving £5 billion per annum. That's nearly half what was wrenched out of government departments in one whole public spending review. The Major Projects Authority and the Major Project Leadership Academy are excellent initiatives. But as ministers have said, the reform plan is an action plan. It's not a strategic document. It does not set out an overall analysis of what is going wrong and why things go wrong, or an overall declaration of strategic intent which informs each of its proposals and places them in a coherent context. It does not even ask the fundamental question of what the civil service is for. Indeed, ministers deny that there is anything fundamentally wrong with our system of government, and it just requires a series of initiatives and changes to put it right. And yet some of these changes, many believe, are fundamental, such as the way permanent secretaries are appointed, which touches on one of the core principles of our civil service. So the question is, what is the right way to go about reform and change and, and get change in one of our great institutions of state, on which the stability of our largely uncodified constitution is founded and the continu continuity of government has depended for a century or more. PASC keeps hearing the narrative which has formed about Whitehall, that there are serious problems with the civil service, that relations between civil servants and ministers are strained, and that they and their spads have to micromanage projects themselves to get things done. Ministers have vented their frustrations with officials in public. If there is no need for fundamental change, why has this narrative been allowed to develop? If this is not the case, what is the narrative that the government is seeking to promote? Where is the narrative which explains the civil service reform plan is the right answer and will resolve these problems? Between 1853, which was the year of the uh, Northcote Trevelyan Report, and the Fulton Committee, which reported in 1967, there was a Royal Commission on the Civil Service about once every 15 years, eight of them. Since Fulton, there has been nothing. Think how much change has taken place in that time. Think how much business has changed. Technology has transformed management practices the way politics works, and the way relationship between the state and the citizen works. Think how different society is today. Think about the effect of devolution and decentralization. Think what the citizen expects of state services, and what politicians think government should be able to deliver. Think how different the state looks today from how it looked in 1967. Think how different is the UK's role in the world, how different governments relate to each other, how globalization has internationalized challenges and decision-making. And think about how all this tests the relationship between the permanent civil service 
and your ministers. Think about how diverse the political and administrative community has become, how much less top civil servants and their political masters may have in common in terms of class, religion and sex and educational background. Think about how much scrutiny to which this relationship is now subject from Parliament, from the freedom of information, from intrusive and speculative media who no longer offer any deference to inherited structures or office holders. There's very little private space to develop those relationships which are crucial at the top of government. This needs deep and objective consideration. The government has not done it. I have suggested a joint committee of both houses akin to the Tauri Commission on Banking to look at the future of the civil service and to lay out a comprehensive programme of reform with cross-party support and the endorsement of Parliament as a whole. The Joint Committee should be tasked to analyse the fundamental questions and to prepare a new strategy for the future of our system of government and how it should be implemented. The recommendations which it would put forward may go far beyond what is contained in the Civil Service Reform Plan in some respects, and they may well represent fundamental change. I suspect the Civil Service and our system of public administration requires far more radical change than is being contemplated to match the global and technological and societal changes that have occurred in recent decades. The alternative is that little will change, and in the next Parliament, Ministers will find it ever harder to get those things done that must be done if our country is to survive and prosper in this age of transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed for that, Bernard. Um, we'll go to the audience in just a second. There are just a couple of things which occurred to me initially. <clears throat> One is around this narrative whereby we have tensions and ministers uh, believe their officials are not acting on their wishes. Um, there might be various things behind it. It might be that the civil service is not effective in doing the job it's being asked to do. It might also be that we have... Um, a parliament in which there's a lot of inexperienced and new Conservative MPs who are sort of Thatcher's children in a way, of small statists, that we have ministers who are very inexperienced and don't understand quite how difficult it is to do things in government, and that we have a press that has an anti-public sector agenda and leaps on these stories. That, that might also create the narrative. I think that does create the narrative, and it's one of the... I think the whole question about looking at the future of the civil service is about exploring the context in which the civil service now has to operate. And you've described one of the contexts that needs to be explored. Um, the question is, is the, the present government's response comprehensive in responding to all the different contexts that we need to explore? I mean, is the civil service reform plan going to mend the problems. I mean, is it going to fix your problem, as you described it, of very inexperienced ministers uh, with very high expectations or unrealistic expectations, taking over very large government departments about which they don't know very much. Um, I mean, I think these, these problems have always existed. I think that uh, in modern government, perhaps the expectations are higher, certainly the external pressures, the visibility of that relationship between you and your minister is much more exposed. Um, and it's one of the reasons we had, we, 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 we've seen the advent of sofa government, because people are trying to hide from the public gaze in an unofficial way um, much of the conversation that would have carried on at a much more official level um, a few years ago. You are describing one of the challenges that civil service reform has got to address. Fair enough. I'm not necessarily denigrating any of my colleagues. Yes. Um, can I ask the audience, actually, a couple of things? Firstly, can you raise your hand if you think that, in parts of the civil service at least, there is a culture where people are afraid or at risk if they tell their superiors, if they go up the chain with concerns around programmes or projects that are ongoing? Does anybody think there is that? That's, that's a good... Good half the audience, perhaps. And I'm, I'm astonished. You're very brave to put your hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Can I also ask 
do you believe that there's a need for a big think about how the civil service operates, whether it be a royal commission or another form of real scrutiny and thought from first principles about what the civil service is there for and how it operates? So who's, who supports that? Still a significant number. Um, do we have a roving microphone? We probably do somewhere. We have one over here. Who's got a question for Mr. Jenkin? It's hard to see, but there's somebody over at the far back there. I see him. Can we put the lights on the audience so we can see? No, don't, because then they'll see me. <laughs> <laughs> My boss might be here. <laughs> yeah, um, see you are, please. Sir. I'd like to ask the right honourable gentleman. I think he's spot on with the the lack of responsibility and accountability in civil service departments. Um, but I want to focus on one particular aspect, which is diversity. Um, I work for Haitian Revenue Customs. And while we have some fantastic policies in respect of diversity, and, and indeed I, and contri I contributed to some of those, when it comes to implementation, there seems to be a lack of it. And I wonder if, it, if that's possibly because there is no accountability for delivering diversity um, across the civil service and in HMRC. Uh, I think amongst the 24 permanent secretaries, there isn't a single ethnic minority. And in this diverse country of ours, it, that's a pretty poor reflection. Um, I was just wondering if the honourable gentleman had any thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, I do have thoughts on that. Um, I think this is a very difficult problem, and it's a problem that we're grappling with in many parts of society. Um, and uh, certainly Gus O'Donnell tried very hard to promote women and people from black and ethnic minorities to positions of influence in Whitehall. Um, and I'm afraid it certainly did contribute to part of the turbulence we've seen at the top of departments. Um, because I don't think anybody would deny that we should be recruiting primarily on the basis of merit. And the minute you start setting targets, however notional, I mean, there is a temptation to try and fulfill the target and compromise other issues. I mean, the challenge is to make sure that the people with talent, whatever their background or sexuality or race or religion, um, come up the system. But I mean, that's a problem of our education system. It's a problem, I mean, th there was one year, I believe that the fast stream recruitment, there was only one ethnic minority in the entire recruitment. So there's something wrong with our education system and our, I mean, I, don't, I certainly don't think it's discrimination. Um, I think the, the the problem is um, uh, dealing with other factors in society that have limited the opportunities of people from those backgrounds. Uh, I think it's a very difficult problem, but it's a problem we cannot address in isolation in the civil service. Um, every part of society has got to address this if it's going to be resolved in every part of society. But, I mean, it's an example of you know, policy aspirations and implementation becoming disconnected. And I think that's what I also hear in your question. Could I just ask you Does, about Do you feel that's turbulence? a fair answer? I'd be very interested if you could tell me if you don't uh, Yes, think that's partly. Fair. I mean, nobody is suggesting that there should be any kind of um, token you know, promotion. Um, certainly, I think there's plenty of talented ethnic minorities out there. Uh, my uncle was actually director of Citibank. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think there's a perception that there aren't the people out there. I think there are the people are out there. I just don't think we're doing hard, working hard enough to get those people into those positions. Um, I mean, in, the, um, the, in, in Birmingham last month, we had an event with uh, Jenny Granger, who's the race champion for diversity in HMRC. Um, and, and there were people there who were just officers and um, higher officer roles, who had two one degrees, who had master degrees, there were doctors in there. And they, they were saying the same thing, the frustration of not being able to go through the ranks even when they were capable and had the academic qualifications. Mm. Uh, I think there's a much bigger problem there, um, which needs to be looked at. And I know that um, Lynn Homer, who's the chief executive, has, has, has been very positive in promoting uh, women, which is, which is good to see. I'm just a bit concerned that doesn't seem to be happening for black and ethnic minorities. Mm. So uh, partly I agree with you, but not entirely. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, I just reflect that one of the most uh, talented permanent secretaries uh, was for an ethnic minority, and he left. Um, um, what a shame, what a loss 
for, for the public sector, but um, people will make their choices. Um, I, I was um, Deputy Chairman for Candidates for the Conservative Party, and the Conservative Party is, you know, we've been very preoccupied with trying to bring, bring forward women into politics and people from ethnic, background, ethnic minority backgrounds into politics. We've had some success, um, not nearly enough. It's very hard. If you're talking about, you talk about Suma Chakrabarti, yep. who of course went to be head of the Euro European Bank, Bank of Reconstruction, Reconstruction and, Development. and Development. And the other ethnic minority uh, perm set we had is, that I can think of is Manoush Shafiq at International Development, who went to be the deputy head of the International Monetary Fund. Mm -hmm. So, which, I mean, that might suggest that to become a perm sec uh, as an ethnic minority, you have to be so massively talented that you're then immediately headhunted by uh, sort of these global organisations. Good point. <laughs> Do we have a further, another question? There's uh, somebody over here. Cheers, thank you. I'd like to build on the point a colleague from HMRC raised, which I do actually think there is a fundamental problem on diversity, and people have good intentions, and there may be something that's happening that's unconscious, but it's certainly it. there is a lot of people who have better degrees than I have who are either at the same grade as me for a long time or haven't got as far, and I can't see from the working with them why they haven't got on. They have the skills. So I think there is something to dig into about what happens when people get in. And if you're not obviously the most talented person, how you can make the best of your career and the departments and government can get the best out of each member of staff. So I think there's probably something we need to do around how we engage each other and view each other. And I know there's a real problem with mini meism because I, I know I'm tempted to do that as well. But it is actually think not being complacent, but actually thinking it keeps coming up. I think we have a problem. Well, I, I, if I may, I'll just take that comment on board. I, don't, is it, I, can, I can respond to that because the, the only general observation I would make, I am astonished um, how little training margin there is in the civil service. I mean, it would be unusual for um, somebody working in private industry these days to have less than three or four weeks training every year. Um, hands up who's had four weeks training in the last year or two weeks training. I saw one hand go up, one hand go up. So has anybody been on a one-week training course within the last year? Has anybody had the five days that you're supposedly entitled to under the Civil Service Reform Plan? Is that I mean, five I, days I, this, is, this, is, this is a problem in the culture. When I say training margin, um, when manpower planning is done in the civil service, it is not assumed that you put it, build in some redundancy so that people can be a way for uh, training. <laughs> um, and no private business could operate like that. Uh, also, the HR function, um, I think, is a very um, undervalued function in the civil service. Um, uh, and it needs, to be, it needs to be much stronger. But I, I would also say, um, the, you know, the leadership and mentoring and, 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 and coaching of, of people. We had, um, I, I, I mentioned Sir David Nicholson in my comments. Uh, he came in front of our select committee last week. He was very candid about his management style. He even joked about it. And then he said that, he told us that his assessment um, was that um, he was very good at setting targets and uh, going hell for leather to achieve them um, and was regarded as a very strong leader in that respect. But he wasn't very good at coaching his team. And maybe one of the problems we have in the civil service, actually we need more of the feminine touch. <laughs> we need to feminize the civil service um, to make it a, a friendly and nicer place and less testosterone charged place to work in order to get more out of all our people, not just women in the service. A further question? There's a lady down here with dark hair who's quick. Hello, sorry. No, not to harp on about the same issue, um, but I joined the civil service fresh out of university four years ago now, um, and 
as somebody very eager to progress in the civil service, have spent quite a lot of time um, actively pursuing shared services and bothering them. And something that I've discovered is a lot of jobs in the civil service are ring-fenced for certain grades. So because I've entered at a certain grade, I cannot go further because the grade system is so entrenched. And I've actually been approached by departments who've asked me to apply for jobs only to have my application rejected by shared services because they haven't read any further than which grade I'm currently working at. And I think I just wanted to raise that as a point because I think that might be something that maybe links in with the diversity mm -hmm. issue as well because a lot of people who are coming in, a lot of the way that this, the face of the civil service is changing are then getting stuck at low grades because they can't apply for the higher jobs that they want to do and would be capable of doing. I, I totally agree with, with that. I think... Um, um, the grade structure and the hierarchical nature of the civil service looks very old-fashioned in today's world. Um, I mean, another reflection of this is the inability to promote people uh, up, up the grade hierarchy, but leave them doing the same job, because we want continuity in that job. I mean, how often I've heard ministers say to me, oh, so-and-so is doing a great job, and then I ask to see this grade seven again, and he's gone. And you say, well, where is he gone? Or she. And um, the person has uh, been promoted. And the only way that person could be promoted, oh, we have to give them their career development. They have to, um, they have to move up, you know, have to have the opportunity to move up a grade. And it was a promotion. Well, why can't they, if they're doing a very good job in that job and they're essential in that job, why can't they stay in that job and be promoted? I mean, this is, um, this is normal in, in the real world, in the outside, outside world. Um, it doesn't happen. I mean, why do we, why do we, we're trying to get continuity in major project management. The only way to do it is by promoting people in post, so that somebody on a 15-year project will actually spend most of their career on that project, uh, but may move up several grades as, as they enhance their skills and experience, may take on additional responsibilities, but they remain the senior project owner. Um, you know, why are we setting up a GOCO in the Ministry of Defence? In order to be able to do that um, and pay the proper salaries that project managers need to be paid, reasonably competitive with the private sector. Um, the only reason, as far as I can see, that we're doing that is because uh, changing the terms and conditions of people who are working in the civil service is too complicated and it's too challenging and we can't do it. I mean, this is not a, this is not a sensible way to run the civil service. Um, I was also going to add, as an additional point, um, that I agree with that because I think the civil service is going to find it very difficult to um, keep hold of talent as, they com as it, people come in because they cannot progress in the role that they maybe enjoy and which they find fulfilling and which they're bringing a lot to. Um, they can't own the thing, uh, their job, they can't f follow it through to its logical conclusion and they will be tempted away by private sector firms that can offer all of these things, mm. um, especially in difficult times when moving up pay scales can be quite important mm. to people, especially from my perspective, young people who are trying to get onto the property ladder, trying to develop in other aspects of their life that can only add to society, community mm. and also to the workplace. And it's when you second civil, civil servants of the private sector, they so often don't come back because they find out what the world outside is like. And, um, um, and, and that reminds me of another point about this discrimination discussion we've been having is that why is it that the civil service still calls people who've come in from the private sectors outsiders? Um, is that what they think of you if you've come in from outside? Even if you're a permanent secretary, you're, you're regarded as an outsider because you didn't grow up inside the civil service. What kind of discrimination is that? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a whole lot of um, um, attitudes um, in the civil service which need to be challenged and rethought. And that's really down to the leadership. I keep coming back in all our reports about administration and change and uh, the top of the civil service. And you know, it all, always comes back to leadership. What, what are the values and aspirations of the leadership and how does that um, inspire the rest of the organization? Um, and if these things are not, if, if we can't grow the right leadership in the civil service, nothing, nothing else will go right. And just deciding to appoint them differently is unlikely to change the, the, ta the character, the aptitudes and attitudes of the leadership that may need to change in this modern world. Just as an aside on the on <clears throat> defence equipment and support, um, there, I don't know. There is a interview with Bernard Gray, the chief exec of DNS, in 
this edition of Civil Service World, which is everywhere. Have you read that one? I haven't read that yet, no. Right. Well, he makes it quite clear, essentially, that his argument for creating a GOCO is because he can't pay people enough um, for to get the talent as he as he wants to 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 negotiate. Well, so he's come up with a very inventive and um, um, possibly sensible solution to get around that problem. But why do, why don't we address that problem head on instead of finding a way around it? Because it applies elsewhere in the civil service. Because he needs treasury sign off for for senior well, salaries. Um, it's interesting about the treasury. Um, uh, the Minister for the Civil Service used to be a Treasury Minister, mm. not for a long time. Um, and the relationship with Treasury, I mean, I really think this is something that needs looking at. Have you thought about how much time and effort at the top of every government department goes into the public spending round? Every year, this grinding, macho, silverback gorilla process absorbing so much time and energy, political effort, manage, senior management effort. Just imagine if you were the civil servant that went back to your permanent secretary and said, oh, I've just given back £10 million to the Treasury because I decided we wouldn't need it. I mean, you'd get shot because, you know, it's meant to be a great, a great ballet, um, you know, a great sort of standoff and a great negotiation. Um, over the last um, six months, we've had the public spending round. Um, it is a very destructive process of, of time and energy and indeed of long-term perspective. Uh, we got rid of, we, we took one and a half percent off the total public spending total, which is you know, 11, 11 and a half million pounds. I mean, that is a tiny amount of money when it's in the margin for error for some social security programs. Mm. I mean, this is really depressing that we spend so much time achieving so little. And, and I wonder what the Treasury's role really should be in um, helping uh, lead government, because it, this can't be the right way of, it's a very old fashioned way of doing it. And do you think it's, uh, is, that, is that a structural problem? It's the way the processes and structures have existed, or is it, is it more a cultural problem? I think a lot of this is down to the fact that ministers are individually accountable to parliament. And we don't see this in local government. Um, um, service heads and their Cabinet, cabinet members in local government are collectively responsible to Parliament, not individually accountable to Parliament. Mm. I mean, the Secretary of State is a, a, a term that turns up in legislation. It might be the Secretary of State for anybody. It makes the Secretary of State feel personally accountable for what's happening in his department. And then it becomes a sort of political game about who's winning, who's losing, who's going to be the leader of the party. And I think there's a whole lot of things that militate against sensible long-term spending decisions. Why haven't we got... 10-year rolling budgets for the defence procurement programme. How are you going to plan? <laughs> How can you plan anything? We've only just gone over to three years. Have we got, gone up to five years yet? Um, how can you possibly plan a procurement plan, a programme, if you don't know what you're going to be allocated into in three years' time, let alone 10 years' time? Mm -hmm. And yet, we all know that the commitments we make when we sign these contracts uh, take us years into the future. You often find that Conservative MPs, whilst they sort of interest is in a, a gradual evolution of the political system to keep up with things. Very wary of major change because you, you don't know, once you tinker mm. with the structure, you don't know what you're going to create. Yeah. How do you, well, where I mean, are you on that? I'm a conservative, so my, my mantra is if, it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I'm in favour of change so things can stay the same. Um, the, you know, the only reason you change things is to is to keep things, keep things as they are. But the point is, there comes a point where an institution um, so badly needs to change. And I think the interesting thing about the present civil service reform plan, actually it's very modest. It's not changing very much. Mm. And yet, so much has changed around it. So much has changed in our society. Is it not, I mean, some people are saying, oh, this is very dangerous. Um, and there may be some controversial bits in it, like the appointment to permanent secretaries or this new idea that seems to be emerging about um, ministers personally appointing much larger private offices around them. Um, I mean, these could, be, these could lead to quite big knock-on changes in the relationship between ministers and their officials. If, they, if ministers spend more time with people they've appointed rather than with the generality of their department, which is actually going to deliver what they want, is that going to help? I mean, I think it's a legitimate question. 
Um, but is just changing the way we appoint people at the top of the civil service, is that really going to change the culture of the civil service? Francis would argue that bringing in people from outside, um, being able to appoint people from outside, um, and allows you to inject new life and new... Um, I mean, I think the efficiency reform group is the best example. It's a really good example, and that Stephen Kelly is doing really transformative stuff. Um, and that couldn't happen if Francis hadn't personally brought Stephen Kelly in against quite a lot of opposition. Um, but uh, the thing about the civil service is about how incredibly resilient it is as an institution. And it, when we've just had some evidence on GOCO and procurement, we're doing an inquiry into procurement, uh, from Peter Levine. And the most striking thing is about his evidence, where, how he describes what he did during the 1980s to transform defence procurement uh, with other people like um, um, Derek Rayner and all those people in the 1980s. And then um, in, um, 20 years later, he comes back and he finds the Ministry of Defence procurement system is very much as it was before he arrived in the 1980s. So that, you know, the stone goes into the pond and then the, the ripples close over the, over the splash and the equilibrium is restored. That's the way this, this is a fantastically strong and resilient service. But imagine if you could harness that resilience to produce the changes you want rather than just ministers desperately trying to do things and change things. And then as soon as the minister's been spat out by the system, it just reverts to type. Some of the people who managed it in the intervening period might just argue that Lord Levine's reforms were a failure and had to be scrapped. Well, if, they were, if, they, if, if, a, if a particular reform relies too much on the particular abilities of one individual, when that individual goes, I mean, we see this with ministers. You know, an ind a single minister can transform the way a department works. When the minister goes, it goes back to how it was before. This is not change management. This is, um, it's, whatever it is, it's not change management. I don't know how to describe it. Um, but don't we need change in the civil service? Don't we want, and how is the civil service going to adapt to this new era of openness and transparency and open data? When the, the, the glare of publicity is going to be shone into, um, into, the, into the nooks and crannies of every government department increasingly. Um, and how, you know, all these pri previously private relationships are, are becoming exposed. How are we going to operate in this climate unless we are, unless the whole system of management becomes much more open? And we explain to the public there are things, things going wrong and things are going to go wrong. I mean, who can guarantee that a hospital is going to be safe? Um, from what the Secretary of State was saying on the radio the other day about CQC, he said, I can't guarantee any hospital is safe because we have, we've got to fix CQC first. Well, I would say to him, actually, you're never going to be able to guarantee a hospital is safe because actually, um, you know, surgery and operations is an in inherently quite risky thing. You know, things do go wrong and people make mistakes. Um, I, I, I make the comparison. The public is very good at, at, um, at tolerating risk where there is confidence that risk is being well managed. So we all get on aeroplanes and we know they crash. From time to time they crash, but we all get on aeroplanes and we know that pilots make mistakes. And pilots submit to an extraordinarily draconian system of safety management, which is very, very exposing for them. They all accept it. And I'm really impressed by the surgeons, the way the surgeons have welcomed this publication of mortality data. I think it's a very, you know, some of them will be pushing back, but the, you know, the Robertson justices of the carry-on um, carry nurse, if you remember, carry-on hospital, what it was called, you know, they're the, they're the past area. You know, it should be possible for a nurse to say to a surgeon, you're doing that wrong, I've got concerns about what you're doing there, without you know, hierarchy coming into play. Openness and transparency within the organisation is the way to develop strong management and a strong culture of, of trust within management. And I think when we're talking about openness and transparency, we need to talk about the openness and transparency of your relationships with your superiors and your juniors has got to be equally open and transparent and trusting. And then I think when the public appreciate that that trust exists within the system, they're far more likely to trust the system itself. 
I think what the public senses at the moment, the trust it, in many parts of the public, uh, public life, that trust does not exist within the system. So how can we expect the public to trust it if um, the people running the thing don't trust each other or don't seem to trust each other? Yeah, there'll be <coughs> sympathetic <coughs> ears listening to many of those points. We have run out of time, I think. We have to, yes, it's gone fractionally over. Um, certainly from my perspective, it's, it's very refreshing to hear somebody um, asking big questions about the way the civil service operates without turning that into a, a, you know, an attempt to attack civil servants, which is, uh, you know, there's a lot of that going on at the moment. But, but as we've heard, many civil servants believe that big questions do need to be asked in a positive way. So thank you. Well, thank you very that. much for the opportunity. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.